Well, good afternoon, everybody, from um, a remarkably sunny London. Um, we're not used to this in uh, uh, what is now the beginning first week of autumn. Uh, it's about 21 degrees, 20 degrees sunny, it says on my computer here. Um, nice warm, warm afternoon. And, and uh, welcome uh, to uh, this webinar, which, uh, and I thank um, our, our host, Marine Tours, um, for the kind of support of the webinar here, part of the Ship Management International uh, program of, of webinars um, on the whole issue of crew changes, the challenges and the regulatory impact of vaccination programs. Just before we go into um, uh, the actual um, webinar itself and the debate, um, the webinar today has been held as part of London International Shipping Week. Um, and this is one of the keystone um, maritime weeks of the, of the calendar, the global calendar. Uh, and indeed is the first opportunity uh, the shipping industry has had to actually get together for the last 18 to 20 months uh, as an industry. Uh, there's about 160 events during the week. Uh, we've already had a number of them already today. I've been hot footing uh, all over the place around London this morning with the opening of the stock exchange this morning, all the way down to I had a meeting with the, uh, Her Royal Highness Princess Royal about five minutes ago. Um, but we have 160 events during the week. Um, and also, as I said, about 55% of them are in person, um, uh, as well as some of them having a hybrid element, but there's also 45% um, are virtual as well. That basically means that the, we have a broader reach. Um, you know, there's more and more people who are actually going to be tuning in through the portal um, for, for London International Shipping Week, and that, that, that is all compelling stuff. So we're very, very excited to be, to be here in London hosting it. We're very excited to be working with you all, and including Marine Tours here, to talk about this, this very, very important issue, the whole crew change. Um, we, had a, we had a big, big uh, conference, ship owner conference this morning, Hans was sitting in on that, where we talked about the whole issue of the seafarer and the crew. Um, and indeed, the, the, the seafarer is at the centre of everything that is happening in the shipping industry at the moment. Um, and more so because of the impact of, of COVID. Um, this whole issue about being, being stuck at sea, the need that shipping has been so resilient and has carried on working and filling our shelves. You know, as we've you know, been ordering all our goods on Amazon and what have you, we've been sitting at home under lockdown, expecting it to arrive, and that's down to shipping. Shipping has done its job and it's done its job very, very well. But then there has been a lot of knock-on implications and impact on that. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. Um, so I'm very, very delighted, very pleased to be welcoming the, the panel um, to you today. You can all see them all in front of you. But I'm going to ask them in turn to introduce themselves um, and also just to talk for two or three minutes just about the whole issue of the, the crew change scenario. What, what challenges it threw up? And also with the impact of the vaccination programs and, and, uh, and really we want to come out of this webinar looking forward. What do we get out of this and how do we move forward and what will the next uh, year to 18 months look, look like? So uh, Costas, if I can ask you, and, and again, thank you very much for your support uh, today. Can I ask you to really put your views into context for, for, for the listeners and also for the other panelists before we start our debate? Over to you, sir. Uh, two to three minutes, if so that's okay. Thank you, Sean. Uh, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to sponsor this uh, great event uh, of the London International Shipping Week. Uh, it's a true honor. Uh, I'm the CEO of Marine Tours. Uh, we're a travel management company which specializes in supporting shipping companies with their traveling needs, primarily crew, but not only, also their corporate traffic. Uh, since March 2020, we have traveled over 90,000 seafarers all over the world and have truly faced uh, all the challenges from the beginning of this pandemic uh, until, uh, until today. Uh, of course, things are a lot better than they used to be uh, 12 or uh, 16 months ago. I remember uh, after the 15th of May, the global border was slowly opening. Uh, regulations would change from the moment uh, a seafarer entered the airplane until the moment they landed, regulations would have changed. Of course, we've gone uh, a lot way, a lot of way through for that until today. And nowadays, seafarers can uh, can travel uh, all over the world almost, 
but uh, it's a very challenging uh, situation. And what makes it a challenge is that we don't have a global policy for, for the traveling of, of seafarers. Uh, unfortunately, each country has its own regulations. And now with the vaccine variable, this has become uh, a bit more complex uh, as well. Uh, through our experience uh, up to now, major destinations like, uh, like the US, China, uh, Japan, uh, Singapore, uh, Australia, uh, New Zealand, have not made any significant differentiations to a vaccinated uh, seafarer versus a non-vaccinated uh, uh, seafarers. And uh, this has to do uh, not only for, for the seafarers themselves, but uh, for other shipping related executives, superintendents, and the executive travel of, of the shipping company, because it's not only the seafarer uh, that is involved in, in the maritime business. Okay. So uh, we've seen that challenges continue to be there. And we don't see great appetite from uh, major countries who represent top maritime destinations to loosen their policies as regards to, to seamen travel. Thank you. In Sean, Sean, you're on mute. Sorry, you're on mute. No, I do apologise. It's normally my, uh, my, my turn to tell that to everybody else. Um, a very, very important point there, and certainly about the differentiation of vaccinated seafarers, and that was something that was raised earlier. Um, that they are, they are not being treated in the same way that maybe air crew and what have you. And it'd be interesting to hear, to hear, hear Matt Rouse's uh, uh, views later on, um, you know, when, we, when we, we come on to that. But thank you very much, Costas, for your comments there. Um, I'm going to just go around my screen here. So I'm going to go on to Theo. Theo, could you, could we get your sort of uh, views there, certainly as a, as a flag state, but if you can introduce yourself, yourself and then your little, your, your, your two to three minute summation on, on the, on the situation as far as it has affected you know, the owners and, and, and the flag sector as well, because you, you guys have a role to play as well. Over to you. Hey, thank you, Sean. Uh, really excited to be on this panel and uh, thanks Marine Tours for, uh, for the invitation and the support of the, of the panel. Uh, as you said, it's, uh, I'm, I'm really sorry that we cannot be on the physically in London, which would be, well, it's always nice to be there, but uh, I'm really delighted because the events are picking up in Greece as well. We have uh, tonight, Kostas and I will be on a very, very important event, the Greek Shipping Hall of Fame. And we expect to have too many people uh, that we will be able to see after a long time. So I think things are picking up on a, on a positive note uh, on, this, on this panel anyway. So my, my name is Theo, Theo Zenakoudis. I'm uh, representing the, the Marshall Islands flag. I'm uh, uh, director of worldwide business operations and also uh, managing director of the Greek office, which cover uh, a big part, of course, of the Greek market and the Mediterranean market. Um, the, the, in terms of the, of the flag business, as you may know, Marshall Islands is one of the uh, top three uh, flags, largest flags worldwide. Uh, soon we will have uh, five more 5,000 ships and uh, we're, reach, we're reaching very close to 185 million cross dollars. That's on uh, not, well, not sell what you know, our figures uh, according to recent uh, um, statistics that we have. So in terms of the challenges, it's been, uh, this is, I guess, like everybody else, this is a tremendous difference in our lives for the past uh, 20 months when we first started dealing with COVID on a worldwide basis in, in our industry. Uh, from a flag state point of view, we had to intervene in a, in a number of cases on uh, ships where uh, the contracts had to be extended. We had to come up with a marine safety advisory as a general policy that we, uh, we can allow seafarers uh, to stay on board uh, in extension of their contracts, sometimes even more than 11 months, provided, of course, that both the seafarer and the ship owner, ship management mutually agree on that. Uh, we had to make sure that the ship owners had a proper plan for uh, uh, repatriation of seafarers. Even if that was all, not always possible, they need to have a plan on board and they need to make sure that the seafarer knows what exactly they are doing and all the efforts they were taking to repatriate them so they can present them on a possible a post control inspection. And that was something that we always try to guide the owners to keep the, the, 
in their system. Another thing that we noticed, uh, especially on 2020, of course, in the first months of 2021, is that we had to come up with a, a big number of dispensations or authorizations when a crew couldn't be replaced in time because of uh, local restrictions that uh, wouldn't allow ship owners to send a relief on board. So we had to make sure that the ships will continue to trade on a safe manner always. But uh, uh, we had to provide uh, money dispensation so the ships uh, will not get stuck for weeks in, in a port. Now, in terms of your question regarding on, on vaccinations, I think Costas covered it. I mean, he has the expertise to cover it better on the, on the, on the travel side. Uh, we don't see any major difference right now. I think it's good that the uh, seafarers are being vaccinated, of course, and the numbers are increasing. I think ICS is with the report today, and if I'm not wrong, 25% of the global seafarers have been uh, fully vaccinated, which is it's, it's a small number, but at least it shows that there is some progress. So hopefully when these uh, numbers uh, arise, uh, not only for seafarers, but also for the rest of the world, there will be a, a kind of a, a one policy in, uh, in every country. So there will not be problems of uh, local restrictions or local quarantines or traveling issues worldwide. You, you talked there about the having to bring in dispensations, Theo, during the whole period, um, where seafarers were able to go past their 11 months. I mean, were there any concerns, though, as far as the impact that's going to have on their ability to do their job? Because when you are, when you're a sea for 15 months, you know, fatigue, mental illness, you know, these issues are really coming to the fore. You're basically stuck with the same 18 people or 14 people for, for, for a year and a half. Yeah. Were there, were there concerns about that? or there's, a, there's always concern about the fatigue, of course, the stress of the seafarers and the, the mental health on board. We didn't have like cases with full crew exceeding 11 months or whatever. There was one or two cases that we had to deal with, especially in the beginning of the pandemic. Things are more smooth now as we speak. Okay, It's not like a year and a half ago or even a year ago, especially last summer. I remember last uh, from April to, to July was, uh, was a really tough period that the crew changes could not take place at all. And of course, we had to consider uh, mental health and uh, fatigue of crew. And we always um, encourage our owners to make sure that uh, they keep the working environment as, as smooth as possible, as, as good as possible for, for their crew. But uh, either we, we like it or not, crew changes were, at some stage were, imp were impossible to take. I mean, they, nobody could travel or nobody could leave the city go home and that was a fact i mean there was nothing to do about it yeah all right thank you very much indeed uh hans i'm going to come on to you um and then captain fauzi and then uh, and then matt and i'm interested to get matt's perspective on this as a from the point of view of an airline but hans you know you you you've been dealing with the the massive administrative burden of, you know, getting visas, moving seafarers, getting them off ship, where they're then in quarantine. You know, how many, how many, can you use taxis? Can you use buses? Talk to us about that, but talk to us about what maybe lessons have been learned out of all of this, because it is, it is a very alien situation we found ourselves in, isn't it? Uh, I first uh, will introduce myself. My name is Hans Boos, CEO of uh, Boos uh, Cruise Services and in the Netherlands, Belgium and Germany. And what CN is all already saying is, uh, yeah, for me, it's a sport to get the people back home. And it was already uh, for us uh, every day a fight to get the, the people back home. And it was only regarding the visa matter. But now it's not only the visa matter, but it's only the way of also the way of talking how to get the people from A to B. And now it's more complicated due to the vaccinations or uh, the PCR test, what have to be done also. But it's also the way of willing how to talk with immigration uh, officers. And, and sometimes it's not possible because they do not have a visa and it depends on the, the way how the people talk in the letter from the from the ship owner with this letter we communicate with the immigration and most of the time we get the things uh, solved and this is the most important how you talk with the immigration 
And in the Netherlands, it's different as you have to talk with the immigration in the Germany or in, in Belgium. And it works. Uh, like in the begin of the uh, pandemic, uh, there were no flights, there were no seats available, and uh, this start with only communication worldwide with the ship owners. If we can make a notice of all Filipinos have to travel from A to B, and you have a good connection with each other, it works. If we know from each other there is an airplane going from Amsterdam to Manila, and it's all with seafarers, I believe it's also much easier talking with the government in the Philippines because we talk about only seafarers instead of also other passengers between uh, these aircrafts. And due to, to, to communicate with each other, it makes it much easier. And it's not only with the airlines, it's also with immigration and government people. Because when I talk only with the immigration, and it's uh, only the crew what we handle, it should be all together that we uh, communicate with them. And then it makes the world much easier and, and much easier to, to organize everything. But Hans, has the situation improved? I mean, you know, certainly as far as the, the red tape is concerned, you know, are you finding that the sort of the, the oils, the wheels have been oiled a little bit more and things have yep. been easier? Over to you. Give me your call. Is it getting better? Yeah, now it's getting better. It's, it's getting better. The, the only problem what we have now is the Chinese national because the, their embassy have uh, told everybody you only can fly back home if you have the, uh, the, 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 the this, uh, special code what will be given by the, um, by the embassy. If you do not follow the, the lines of the embassy, forget it, you stay at home or you, you're stuck somewhere. Okay, okay. Well, there's a, there's a lot of, of uh, info there for food for thought. I'm just jotting down some notes here that we will start talking about in a minute. Uh, Captain Fauzi, I'm going to come on to you. Um, I'm really, really keen to get yours. You, you've been at the sharp end of all of this as well um, throughout the whole of the last year or 18 months or so. Um, and I think when we had our chat last week, you said, yeah, I'm going to sort of hold you back because you might be on stage for about an hour talking about the whole issue of vaccination. But what would have been the sort of key sort of elements, do you think, from, from the perspective of, of a big ship management company and a crew manager? I mean, what would, what would, have, would have struck you most uh, for the last 18 months of this whole crisis? Yeah, th thanks, Sean. Uh, uh, good afternoon, good uh, good day, everyone, wherever uh, uh, they are, uh, you are. And uh, I'm really pleased to be here. My name is Captain Fauzi Fradi. I'm the director of crewing at Columbia Ship Management. Uh, so, Sean, uh, uh, yeah, I won't talk for one hour for sure because <laughs> that that one hour can be really used for for a lot of the stuff. Uh, I, I agree with uh, with Hans. Uh, the fact that uh, how you handle all these uh, crew changes now with the immigrations, with the embassies and all, the, <laughs> yeah, that sounded very familiar when I was listening to him. <laughs> and, uh, and this is something we do on day to day basis. Uh, look, Sean, things have changed over the 18 months. Okay, let's be clear about this. So the things have changed a lot and things are changing very fast. And uh, each month is different. Uh, so no one can say that he actually knows how to handle uh, how to handle things because information is changing. You heard about China, uh, that also things are changing there. Uh, there are very very challenging uh, issues which we have, and uh, the main the main ones. Uh, people, some people cannot get visas, so th this this is some crew cannot get visas. So even if you have the replacement, even if crew change can happen, it is sometimes very difficult to get the persons of some countries do not allow crew change. Still, you can't do crew change. Uh, uh, China, the Far East is a, is a very difficult place to handle. Uh, Europe, very cooperative, very, really very easy, very nice place to be as usual. <laughs> so this is something which is coming back to normal. Uh, after the difficult days, thanks to the vaccination, thanks to the mentality of people and so on, understanding of seafarers. Uh, so I, I'm not concerned about Europe, actually it's the opposite. <clears throat> but Far East remains extremely challenging place. Uh, 
uh, not only that, uh, there are also issues when it comes to when seafarers are found positive or tested positive, either when they are traveling uh, with very strict quarantine rules, especially also in the Far East again, uh, very strict testing rules, uh, and also um, the worst part, if they get sick on board. Uh, that's that's another ball game. That's another story. When people get sick on board, uh, it the whole thing is full of surprises. It's like it's like you are living a horror movie. You don't know what is the end of it, and what's going to happen to it. Uh, of course, we we are handling we are handling our crew uh, well-being and welfare always to 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 the best we can do night day nights non-stop. Uh, but it becomes extremely challenging and extremely stressful when uh, people's lives is at stake. Uh, if it's about missing a flight, staying another one month or two months on board, I understand it's extremely bad, extremely embarrassing, but it's not life-threatening. When you have sick crew on board or people in endangered on board ships and they cannot get the treatment they deserve, uh, the, the treatment, which was something uh, on the maritime industry, we've been always proud about it. You know, you just, in case of emergency, the captain contacts the MRCC and you can get people evacuated from ships by helicopter, by boats, by whatever. This was something that I was at least proud of it when I was sailing, that it's something which is a good solution on the maritime industry. Regardless, you have visa, you don't have visa, nobody cares who you are. You just get that support in case of emergency. Now, even that simple, and we, you spoke about regulatory point of view here and how this pandemic is affecting us. So is that still applicable or not? Is it worldwide? Is that conventions are still in place? Uh, is, is the seafarer in need of emergency medical attendance still can get it, even if it's COVID? Uh, so these are things which, which we are, uh, we are questioning uh, and uh, we don't see it actually happening uh, when, it, when, uh, when there is a case. Uh, luckily, unfortunately, uh, to be honest and to give credit, the majority of countries are, are, are very cooperative, but uh, however, a few, a few number of countries are not. Uh, and this is, this is uh, challenging. Okay. Uh, so of course, uh, the, the final point, which I would, uh, I would add here, that uh, the uh, frequent change of regulations based on the, uh, the uh, pandemic rates in each country uh, keeps creating a lot of challenge for seafarers. And I, I, I think we keep talking about it for the past two years, uh, since, since the pandemic started, if the seafarers should have that status, yeah, of key workers and so on, but I think we should, we should do something on the, on the legal point of view. And to close my, my remark, uh, I also think that on the legal point of view, we should review uh, the vaccination of seafarers, uh, whether it, if there is a chance it becomes compulsory because that's, that's the life of many other people at stake, uh, whether someone wants to be vaccinated or not. I don't think anyone has the freedom to put the life of others at risk. So that's at least my personal point of view. <clears throat> I think that's going to be an interesting point there, uh, Fauzi, and I think one that we'll touch on in a second, not that we've heard, heard Matt's point of view, um, this whole issue about vaccination seafarers, because I think Mark and Neil were saying this morning that you know, there's a third of seafarers who are refusing to be vaccinated, um, and then that has a knock-on effect on, you know, how do you, are you employing them and how do they fit in and they're on board a ship unvaccinated etc so there's a, there's a whole raft of issues there but thanks for your comments so far and thanks for keeping it to, to a, a few minutes there uh, Fals, who will, will no doubt be, be tapping, tapping your thoughts uh, in a second um, can I um, now come on to Matt Rouse uh, Matt uh, from Qatar Airways um, and, and, and good, good to, to hear you today but obviously we, we've got you coming in on the phone line today but could you give us your point of view there, certainly from an airline's perspective. And, um, and can I just say, also say um, uh, thank you very much to Qatar for your involvement during London Shipping Week. You helped to open the London Stock Exchange this morning as well. So thank you very much for your, for your contributions. But uh, your, your comments on the, on the debate at the moment, uh, Matt, would be, would be welcome. 
Okay, well, thank you for the opportunity to join you by phone. And I would like to point out that it's a sunny 40 degrees here in Doha. So thank you. I think almost double your uh, late seasonal weather over there. And I tell you what, I think I'd probably prefer 21 right now if I had the choice. First to introduce myself, my name is Matt Rouse. I'm Senior Vice President of Global Sales at Qatar Airways. Uh, that's kind of a broad role, but one thing that it involves and one thing that has become very important uh, to us as a type of business, but also important to us uh, in our hearts has been the journey of the seafarers in the last year. Uh, I'd, I'd be pretending if I said I was an expert on this before the pandemic, but I like to think my team and I have become expert, at least at the air travel logistics in keeping marine crews moving since the pandemic began. And I, I heard a lot from the panelists, I'll come back to that, but perhaps I could start by just sharing a few figures to put things in context. And I, I'm well aware that the global economy has kept ticking along through the pandemic. And that means the shipping industry and indeed the air freight industry uh, operating in high levels of demand. And the systems have become constrained with all of the difficulties in accessing flights and borders and crew change constraints that the other panelists have mentioned. So far from the Qatar Airways perspective, since the beginning of that pandemic, we're pleased, we're proud, and we're humbled to say that we carried more than half a million uh, seafarers and offshore workers, either from their crew change back to their home country, or just as importantly, from their home country out to join the ship and to take on new contracts. I think I heard in there, particularly from Hans, talking about working with regulators and authorities and sometimes it being a bit easier if you can say a flight is dedicated for seafarers. Uh, from our perspective, we've now operated more than 100 charter flights just for seafarers. Uh, in particular, this was important in the earlier phase of the pandemic when many countries were fully closed. It's also been important for the cruise ship industry to re-establish their operations, where I guess they have the challenge of moving literally hundreds of people for the same movement at the same time. And it has also become a line of business that we operate to some closed countries to keep seafarers and crew changes open. And a good example of that might be Sri Lanka in our case. I think if I look at our pandemic journey, we've also tuned in a little bit to the mental health crisis that the shipping industry has been trying to work through. I think from our perspective, we have tried to make the journey a little bit easier and we're conscious that people's flight connections may not be as smooth as they were uh, compared to pre-pandemic schedules and levels of flying. And that was among the reasons we decided to open a lounge uh, lounge at our hub airport here at Hamad International in Doha, specifically for seafarers. We call it the Mariner Lounge. Entry is complimentary to all seafarers. Anyone carrying their ship's crew papers is eligible to enter. And we've been pleased to welcome more than 70,000 guests into that lounge since we opened it last November. I, if I may, I heard a few comments from some of the other panelists that I would like to give an aviation perspective on, and I think I heard all the panelists mention about disruptions and that being a reality, and I think there were specific mentions of the difficulties in getting people into China and doing crew change for the Philippines. Uh, I think I would add to that list from our perspective, India being quite a challenging market to keep seafarers moving. and. You know, I, I think it's something that, as Hans said, when we all talk through the industry and with the regulators and the authorities, that really is the solution. And that's part of the reason why our company or our airline likes to engage in panels like this. Because we are living in a world of disruption. We are living in a world of increased complexity. 
and managing that comes with costs on all sides. So, for example, to return to the Philippines, it's heavily restricted on airlines going in, which therefore leads to increased pricing. Uh, I think that's just a reality that we need to work through until the world has a coordinated and consolidated response to the pandemic. If I may one, offer one final aviation perspective, and I've followed with some interest the debate around vaccination and ensuring vaccination for seafarers. I think uh, from the Qatar Airways perspective, we are fortunate uh, to be the airline for a country that moved very fast with vaccination. And I'm pleased to report that in our country, more than 79% of the total population including all the children. So more than 79% is now fully vaccinated here in Qatar. And aviation was one of the industries prioritized in this country's rollout program. So that all Qatar Airways staff had been vaccinated, I'm gonna say by sometime in June. So I think we've been lucky to be at the forefront and I'm very interested to hear whether we can get practical solutions to help more seafarers become vaccinated, because we're conscious many come from, or many originate in home countries where we have large populations and slower rollouts. And you know that's not meant as a criticism, but we've seen how vital the seafarers are to keeping the global economy moving. And I think we'd like to look for collective solutions to address that problem. So thank you for the opportunity to join today, and I look forward to the rest of this very engaging panel. Mm, brilliant, thank you very much, Matt. And I'm, I'm gonna really open it up now to all the panelists. I mean, if you just all um, unmute yourselves, uh, and also to the, to the delegates who, who are listening in as well, please send through your questions. You'll see at the bottom of the screen, there's a Q&A and there's also a chat facility. Send through the questions. We'll also um, do our best to actually table those to, to the speakers itself. I mean, there's a, there's a number of issues here. I'm going to talk about the the cost of travel just to get that out of the way. And, and Matt, thank you very much for touching on that particularly um, emotive issue where, we're, where managers or, or, or crew travel companies have seen the cost of uh, moving seafarers, you know, increase sixfold or whatever, significant increases. And I just really want to... To, to bring in the panel, I'll start with Costas. We haven't heard from you for, for 20 minutes or so, Costas. You were kind enough to, to kick off the debate. Um, you know, th these are challenges, aren't they? These, these, are, these are challenges yes. that cost as much as anything else. You, you know, what, what needs to be done about all of this, do you think, to, to get back to some sort of sense of normality? As Hans was saying earlier, we are getting back to, to some, yeah. some sort of level of that. But uh, operationally, cool. talk to me. Yeah. yeah. Uh, thank you, Sean. Uh, cost is uh, cost is a result of uh, the minimal options that we have in our hands in order to travel uh, seafarers from point A to point B and to point C, and that's exactly where regulation uh, steps in and uh, either allows for uh, many airlines so increased seat availability to be in the market, hence prices will will go down or it does not allow for more airlines or more availability of existing airlines to enter into a market where we have fares uh, being up. Uh, at the moment, prices are up uh, in, many, in many destinations, not just 20, 30%, uh, but 100, 200, 300%. Uh, it's not, a, it's not uh, a matter of price uh, at the moment to travel people, it's about uh, availability. Uh, many important countries like uh, the Philippines have uh, daily quotas only for Filipino, ranging from a thousand people to two thousand people uh, mm -hmm. per day. So seat availability is like gold uh, there. Uh, an even worse situation is uh, Australia, uh, where the, the quota is even uh, is even worse. You almost it's almost impossible to get people uh, in. Uh, China with its own constraints, Japan, uh, even even passing through the U.S. for Schengen, uh, for example, uh, travelers, uh, you cannot go through transit. Uh, you can 
enter the US to join the vessel, but you cannot touch base and pass through the US, for example, to go to Jamaica or other destinations. So you have to go through another route. Now, this another route has another price. Uh, so all this uh, complexity, it has to do, again, with the weather seafarers, depending on nationality, point of origin, and point of destination, are allowed to travel freely compared to the way they were traveling uh, 18, 19, 20 months ago, when the pand pandemic was on, was not uh, on the table. Now, uh, so costs are up. And uh, at the end of the day, there's not much you can do uh, about it when we're, you're uh, challenging to get a seat. Uh, okay. Uh, but question, the question here is the vaccination program that is that every one of us here uh, i hope believe in and uh, we want it to be uh, widespread what has been done for these seafarers to be vaccinated uh, theophilus said only 25 percent is vaccinated okay uh, captain fauzi very well said let's make it compuls compulsory if we can but even if we do will they be allowed to travel freely is the vaccination program opening the borders or is it keeping the borders closed? So there's no incentive at the end of the day for the whole system okay, to push uh, uh, to, to, to a global vaccination uh, uh, policy agreement. What say you? That's my point. Here. Well, let me bring in uh, Fauzi on this and then bring in Hans and, and say to all the, you know, Theo, if you have any things to get hand up and, and we'll, we'll, we'll let's get this debate going and also Matt as well. Um, but Fauzi, you know, what, what are your thoughts on this? Because it, this is all sort of quite compelling stuff, really. What, what's your input? Uh, well, I think cost has touched up on so many things. Uh, the, the the pricing is is uh, the cost is definitely uh, something terrific. It's 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 something we never seen before. I mean, flights to Australia, for example, it's uh, it's sometimes ridiculous how much you have to pay for for a seat. Uh, th this I, I, I struggle a bit to understand uh, why it has to be like that, especially if, if there if there are people who have the logistics to to charter flights and there are so many so much demand to fly seafarers, for example, to Australia. Uh, this sometimes perhaps to put all the all the parties together and try to find a solution, uh, especially when there is a volume. So that's something. Uh, maybe we can discuss uh, off the panel uh, to, uh, with with uh, some colleagues. However, on um, on the vaccination, uh, Costas, I can answer to you. Maybe yes, maybe no. So, <laughs> sorry for not bringing better news, because not all the vaccine vaccines are actually recognized everywhere or approved or even in the uh, emergency lists. Uh, because, for example, the Russian vaccines, I give you an example, are not uh, approved in Europe. So if you are Russian seafarer, you come to Europe, you still have to do quarantine. And then it's a problem. So th 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 these, are, these are small things which, which um, no, I don't think uh, at 100%, or at least if I understand you well, as global solution, vaccination will fix the traveling problem or, or make it better. Perhaps, yes, at a certain extent, but not global-wise. But what is good, that regardless what is this vaccine they take, there is a degree of protection which is approved locally by that country, by that government, which let's assume, of course, that it, it, it will help seafarers not to get very sick. And this is very important. This is the most important for me, is the health of the crew. Of course, all the other logistics, they come, they come at, at a certain level of importance, but the most important for me, regardless which vaccine they take, as long as it's approved by their national uh, government, it's fine. We want them to get vaccinated. Uh, I heard the, the uh, colleague from uh, Qatar Airways, uh, and I would on that. That would be an amazing initiative that many airlines can do, and especially the uh, big airports and where, where is the major hubs for, for, uh, for transfer or crew change. Uh, I heard Copenhagen, I heard, I'm not sure to be honest, uh, is, is offering such facility to get vaccinated during your transit through the airport. 
uh, that's an amazing thing, especially if we talk about the single shot vaccines like Johnson & Johnson. Uh, that will be an amazing chance for the seafarers. At least they will have the choice, Sean, right? If yeah. they do not like to take whatever vaccine, they will have the choice. And uh, those who uh, did not manage to get it because it's very difficult in Philippines, for example, or some other countries, I don't know about India really too much, but uh, they can at least maybe get it through the airport. So uh, these are these are very, very good initiatives and uh, they will change really our industry a lot. So that cooperation between, uh, between the airports, airlines and the maritime industry will help. Hans, let me bring you in and then I'm gonna, there's some questions coming through that I just want to pose as well. So uh, Hans, give me, give me your views on all of this. Certainly as far as this whole issue about the vaccines and whether countries are actually accepting the Sinopharm or, or Sputnik or whatever, that must be throwing up a lot of issues. In, in Amsterdam, it's also possible to, to, do, uh, to arrange the vaccinations between the flights. It's only, it's only a few, it's difficult to get an appointment in the health center of, uh, of KLM in the transit area, because when you have the possibility to vaccinate the crew, uh, it becomes always the question, do they have a visa? And uh, uh, until now, people from outside Europe are not uh, allowed to cross the border. So even when we have the willing to assist the crew to, to vaccinate them, there is still a, a border between uh, if, if there is no uh, possibility to get it in the transit area and we are willing to get them out, we need to talk again with the immigration. And uh, some immigration chiefs, they are willing, okay, let them go and let them in uh, to do the vaccination and bring them in again. But it's, it's still a big issue to, to get people vaccinated, even when the, there is a willing and there is a possibility to vaccinate them in the country. In, when they come in with a, with a vessel, we have plenty, plenty arrangements to, to uh, vaccinate the people during the port stay of the vessel. It's possible. I mean, Theo, let me bring you in on it. <clears throat> I mean, you know, as, as, a, as a flag state, you sit at the IMO at Marshall Islands, you, you are a uh, very, very influential uh, member of the uh, of the IMO there, you know, and seafarers were sort of granted key worker status, I think, some months after the pandemic, um, you know, struck. But I don't think it was certainly something that was taken up by, by everybody. I mean, is enough being done for this? Because, you know, seafarers are very, very important. Shipping is so important. But still, these poor people aren't allowed off, off, of vessels, it's, it's just not good enough. So, um, what, what's, your, what's your input on that? And then I'm going to go to some questions. We've got some good questions coming through. But carry on, Theo. Yeah, I know. I know it's it's tough to answer that if uh, enough has been done. I guess uh, according to the results that we all discuss here today, apparently whatever has been done is not enough. I mean, the designation of uh, seafarers as key workers for me is quite critical, and I think uh, the, a big number of flag states have. Uh, surrounded the effort done by the IMO of this and they are listed in the countries that they have designated seafarers as key workers. And I think uh, the, initial, the initial idea was to facilitate the uh, uh, traveling of seafarers so they're able to go on board and uh, uh, go ashore whenever that's necessary. I think what we have to include here is the, 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 the vaccination program for seafarers. I mean, IMO has uh, uh, provided a roadmap according to uh, an effort done by, by IECS before last May. But I think it's important on the designation of uh, seafarers as key workers is to include the vaccination. I mean, for us traveling, there are issues right now. I mean, even for the majority of the people that have been vaccinated, there are countries with different approach on vaccination. And that's, that's part of the problem. I mean, and I hear some people say, why I should get vaccinated if I'm gonna travel to Far East or Middle East or whatever, and I cannot get there and they have restrictions or whatever. Which is which is quite uh, it's which is quite normal question, but I think seafarers are different. We are not I mean we are not essential workers for traveling. At least some of us. Okay, we can stay home for a while, but seafarers cannot stay home. So there should be a, a kind of a different approach uh, when it comes to them. And uh, if the majority of them are vaccinated, they must be able to go on board ships and leave the ships whenever it's necessary. They shouldn't have restrictions. Uh, I mean, local, local governments should be able to treat seafarers as well as key workers. And that's the gap between IMO and local governments. I mean, IMO has done a tremendous effort, including the major flag states, 
on recognizing uh, seafarers as key workers, but that has to go to the, to the local level of, of the national governments. And that's where sometimes uh, either the spike of uh, cases on a local level or uh, uh, deaths in the countries or uh, ICUs getting fooled on different countries, that has prohibited the, uh, the, the enforcement of the whole uh, designation, if you allow me to say. Yeah, thank, thanks for that, Theo. Uh, Matt, can I just get a comment just from you? Because, I mean, I think the one uh, comparison that shipping always has with the aviation industry, well, in fact, there's, always, there's a number of comparisons that they try to, 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 to look at, but one being that air crew walks straight through when it comes to immigration um, and the poor seafarers don't, don't get that, that, um, uh, that facility. Well, why, why do you think shipping isn't treated in the same way when it comes to moving and being moved around the world? What, what, what do you think is, is the real root of the problem here, Matt? I, I'm not really sure I can speak for why shipping is not, but I think in the case of aviation, bear in mind that as pilots and cabin crew move around the world, they are generally required to go into a form of hotel quarantine from the moment they arrive till the moment they depart. So, you know, I'm not pretending that uh, aviation is doing it tougher than the maritime industry here, but it's also quite heavily regulated. Uh, I think, let me also comment on uh, the cost of airfares currently. And I think a few panelists mentioned Australia, which happens to be my home country. On many of our flights to Australia right now, we actually have more crew on board than passengers because of the limits placed on our passengers and the number we're allowed to bring in, in the case of that country's quarantine requirements. Uh, so, you know, it, it's unfortunate, but if you're only allowed to take in a single digit number of passengers on a long haul flight, then the pricing somehow or other reflects that for the service to be viable in the first place and therefore to be reliable. And I think right now reliability is the thing people value the most. Okay, okay, that's 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 an interesting point there. I'm gonna to come to some of the questions here. Um, and I'm gonna throw them out to the to the to the panelists. Can from Michelle uh, Bachman from Lloyd's List, can you please outline the difficulty dealing with a vessel when there's a COVID outbreak and speak about the prevalence of these events? So I think we talked about the um, you know a positive case on board ship. Um, who wants to who wants to answer that first? Fauzi, do you want to have a go at that one? When you've got a uh, a COVID outbreak on board ship, you know what are the difficulties? What's it like? I'll just take one second, Sean. One second. <clears throat> let me let me come on to um, let me come on to Hans first, then before they come on to, to Fauzi. Um, just in answer to Michelle's point there, when you've got somebody who's positive, and I think we've talked about this in the past, Hans, you know, how do you deal with it? What, what, what is involved? How, how much of a problem is it when you're dealing with it with the travelling side? And then we'll come on to Fauzi. Yeah, Hans. No, when, we, when we had a case in the past, uh, we have several cases in the past with uh, people tested positive on board the vessel. The first, of the, the first thing what we have to do is make a plan together with health authorities and with uh, immigration. And if crew have been tested positive uh, after this uh, communication with immigration and the health authorities, we can take the crew direct from the vessel and put them in a hotel and put them in uh, isolation. So, and after that, we start with the immigration to arrange the visa and arrangement. But most important is take them from the vessel and uh, put them in quarantine in the, in the hotel. And if it's, uh, it depends with, with company, uh, what the company policy is uh, to, to disinfect the vessel. And uh, maybe also uh, some companies, they say, okay, let's change the whole crew. Right. And this is what happened uh, f f uh, yeah, a few, uh, with a few vessels that we have to uh, take all the crew from the vessel. And due to the communication with health authorities, we could line up uh, the disinfection of, uh, of, of, the vas of the vessel. And then a few crew members stay on board and we bring the new crew on board. No, no, but okay. with communication with immigration and health authorities. Captain, do you, want to, do you want to add into that? I mean, you, you know, you'd have been dealing with this over the last year and a half or 18 months. What, what, what's involved in this? 
Okay. Well, the, the, the possibility of having uh, COVID uh, on the ships, it's existing. It's a pandemic, uh, the same like we have seen it uh, all around the world. The ships are not immune. Of course, the ships, they were, uh, they were very lucky. <laughs> Maybe when the seafarers were very unlucky that there were no crew changes. Actually, these were the lucky moments yeah. for them to, to be away from the virus. Uh, when that time, uh, people were rightfully saying that the safest place to be is on board the ship. Yeah. Now situation has changed, uh, crew changes are available and happening and people moving and vaccination open it up. Uh, what I think is that as industry, we need to look at as this issue with a more of uh, tolerance and understanding. Uh, the people can get sick, COVID is there, it's a pandemic. And the fact to consider a ship which has uh, some people some crew member with COVID is like a dangerous vessel. I don't think that's the right way of approaching it. Uh, I know what Hans is talking about it in in Netherlands. is is a very structured approach in the Netherlands, but unfortunately, it's only very very rare and few countries who are so structured like like, like your place has. So you're lucky. Uh, but but uh, there is is a very good job done. Uh, we heard a lot of stories as well of uh, people who, uh, luckily we, we didn't get to that situation, but we heard stories of crew members who could not be offered treatments and uh, yeah, and they might even uh, get into a very dangerous situation. What I, what I would suggest using this panel, uh, Sean, the way that uh, ICS and IMO and uh, other, other players of the industry looked at uh, the vaccination program, the way Intertanku looked at the outbreak management plan on board. Uh, I think this is something that we need to do as industry and we need to look at two options. Option one, when you have fully vaccinated crew, how should be the approach? I mean, if the crew are fully vaccinated and one guy got some light symptoms, you know, very yeah. mild fever and some... So what's the problem? Why the, sh the, crew, the ship cannot continue her operation? What is the, I'm, I'm not the expert here, but these are things which need to be looked at. Uh, I didn't look at them myself yet. Uh, what is the risk uh, which comes with it? Uh, and the option B when, when of course the crew are not fully vaccinated. And this should be a very good motivator to the whole industry and seafarers themselves to get fully vaccinated. So they know that if, even if there is an outbreak on board, they're not gonna lose their jobs, go back home. And like Hans said, full crew change. I mean, if I joined the vessel one week ago, so here we go again, you know, I'm back home and <laughs> let's start from scratch. So that's not a good news, right? Uh, so we, we have to consider all that and all the cost which comes with it, all the disruption to the operation. And of course, my words uh, to be very specific here, health of the seafarers is the most important. Right? There is no no other priority, uh, but definitely we we need to learn. Uh, like every country has learned, right? Um, now people they get COVID, they just sent home for quarantine. Most of them do not need to go to the hospitals. Uh, so things have improved since one and a half years. I hope we will also benefit as industry from all this learning and improvement. <clears throat> I mean, Costas, let me bring you in on this. I mean, uh, good points there raised by by Fauzi, and certainly. There is a view in the industry that, um, you know, employers should be saying to seafarers, you don't get a job unless you've been vaccinated, you know, or, or we are only going to be going down that route. I mean, what, what's, what's, looking at the two options there, that sort of fully vaccinated crew, you, you know, life has got to continue. And that's certainly, I think, something that's happening here in the UK, you know, where, you know, the, the, the impact of, um, of COVID on vaccinated people is quite low, death rates are low, et cetera, et cetera. Let's, we still got to carry on and get the economy moving. What's your views on, on, on what Fauzi was saying there with option one and option two? And also maybe on the point about vaccinated seafarers, if you want a job, you have to be vaccinated. Yeah, you know, the, the whole vaccination uh, discussion is a very delicate issue. Uh, and it depends uh, on which context do you view COVID. Uh, do you view COVID as a personal thing or, uh, or a social thing? Uh, social situation. Uh, as long as we live uh, amongst each other in uh, global societies, I think it's a social thing. 
it's not something that one should uh, care only for themselves. Well, that's my, that's me. Okay, that's my my, my opinion for for Costantinos, for my body and and myself. It's not easy to to put another person uh, in this uh, uh, dilemma. Uh, keep your job or uh, or lose your job, depending on the, on the vaccine. Uh, the truth is that uh, we would uh, we would have a very less disrupt disrupted the travel environment and social environment and business environment if every if everybody would be vaccinated but i just don't see the governments uh, putting incentives out there especially for seafarers to get uh, vaccinated uh, yes it would save uh, a lot of money for the for the shipping company it would save lives uh, i fully agree that uh, the life of the seafarer is a priority but also, it's something that one should uh, should value it for for himself. Um, I think that all seafarers uh, take their life into consideration. Uh, for me, it's a very difficult decision to make it compulsory. But uh, I would definitely uh, think on incentives for the vaccinated uh, seafarers uh, versus the non-vaccinated, and that's what the regulators, I think, should think about. Okay, um, Theo, have you got any comments on that that you want to add in? I'm going to then ask some more questions that are coming in. We can get some good interaction from the audience at the moment. But Theo, yeah. over to you. Yeah, I guess the only Costa says regulators, he, he's referring to us more or less on the maritime side. But yeah, definitely it's something that we have to consider. I mean, it, it has to be considered in the IMO. I mean, I don't want to repeat what everybody said, but for me, it's uh, the vaccination has two sides. The one is protecting life of people. I mean, when you have crew on board and they travel, they cross over the Atlantic or they make long trips and they have uh, COVID symptoms and their oxygen is falling completely down. First of all, is to protect their life. And that's really important for, for people to understand that the vaccination is a, a kind of weapon we have against COVID. And uh, since the scientists came out with this uh, in, a, in a quick manner, probably you have to take advantage of it. But the second thing, and uh, in a, in, on the commercial side and the business side of things, is uh, vaccination should change our life on a, in, in a more practical level. There's, there has to be a universal approach for all of us traveling, including the seafarers, and probably uh, have an additional uh, uh, planning for, for seafarers traveling when they are vaccinated, so they don't have the kind of restrictions that we are facing. And uh, uh, I do have a hope that uh, when the vaccination program is increasing in all over the world, because right now uh, in some of the, let's say, developed or underdeveloped countries, it still doesn't roll out quite quickly. But when things are getting better uh, in the upcoming months and we have more people vaccinated all over the world, probably the countries will come up with a kind of a one plant for, for everyone. And uh, CFRs will be treated as they should be treated because they they really play a more than important role in our lives. Yeah, 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 that's an interesting point. And I think something that was raised right at the beginning of the debate, you know, talking about a global travel sort of plan there, you know, and I think that probably has to come in. You know, it is quite alarming when you look and even you know, bringing in, um, you know, um, Australia and New Zealand and some parts of the Far East, the, the take up of vaccinations down there is so low. And it is a very low level because they really felt that they'd really sort of um, isolated themselves from 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 the actual uh, pandemic itself. Um, Adrian Simpson here has has um, asked, you know, looking for an online platform for crew change. Do the panel see an increased use of digital options and AI, artificial intelligence, to improve crew changes? Who wants to answer that one? Who'd like to answer that? Costas, we'll never go with that, uh, Constantinos. Uh, as, as, as regards the travel side, uh, I wouldn't uh, recommend it because, as uh, Captain Fauci said before, uh, the situation with regulation is so dynamic uh, that it cannot be consolidated, uh, and the variables are so many, changing uh, so many times. Uh, you need uh, not only one person, but many persons on the other side of the phone. You need hands, you need the travel management company, uh, okay, you need the, the crew operators, the crew manager, uh, even the crew itself, because many times uh, at the airport, there are so many things that can go wrong and you have to talk with the actual passenger. 
So as regards travel side, I would highly not recommend it uh, for dig a digitalized uh, approach. Now, as regards the, the changes themselves, I think Captain and uh, Captain Faust and Hans are more specialized to, to go into that. Fauzi, do you want to add into that at all? Yeah, uh, thanks. Yeah, thanks, Costas and uh, Sean. Uh, definitely uh, a general, a general uh, information if it's available on, on a digital platform. It helps. But I agree with Costas. Unfortunately, you still have to go for each local agent in that specific port. And even if you ask it yesterday, you are not sure tomorrow if that information is still valid. And you keep asking again and. Okay, maybe this is not the case for, for ports like Rotterdam, I mean, for us, but for, for many other small ports around the world, things change a lot. And, and even in the same country, we've seen it like China again, we spoke a lot about China today. Uh, each terminal, not even port, each terminal, even if it's in the same port, they might have different rules. Uh, and uh, no, that's that's definitely will be a bit uh, misleading. But of course, some some uh, major agencies they offer some websites which are helpful to to certain extent, and we have to admit that as well to acknowledge at least their efforts. Okay, we, we we've got anonymous attendee, which I always love it when you get a question from somebody who's anonymous. Um, but uh, do you believe that it is ethical to terminate a seafarer's contract if he or she refuses to get vaccinated? Who'd like to take that one on? Theo, I let me comment on that as well. Okay, oh, you, 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 yeah. you go first and then Theo. So, sorry, Theo. Yeah, uh, actually, Theo is better placed than me to answer that. But just to make clear that what perhaps was a misunderstanding of what we said. Uh, no, at least from what I heard until now, no one said that there is an intention to terminate the contracts of seafarers. Uh, a contract which is valid cannot be terminated just like that. But of course, for, for the new employment and new contracts, with the seafarers, uh, it will be uh, it will be of course uh, important to to make sure that uh, that there is a regulation in place. It's not for for us as employer to tell the seafarer no, I will not employ you because you don't have uh, vaccination. It's better to have an uh, a contract, uh, sorry, a regulation in place. And if I remember, I don't know, maybe 20 years ago, I was asked my by my crew manager to go and get some vaccines you know <laughs> which i just went and i got these vaccines i even don't even know what they are about uh, things have now become so sensitive where actually uh, people lives are at stake so is it ethical that somebody goes to the ship and gets everybody infected with a chance that somebody can even die in the middle of the ocean because he has no access to to first uh, for first aid treatment or, or emergency services so I, I can answer to that question with another question, also anonymously, Sean. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> there, like, let me get your views on that there. Yeah, okay. I'm not, I'm not, thanks, Sean. I'm not going to speak as a regulator here because the question is very specific. It, it doesn't say if you have the right to terminate the contract. It says if it's ethical. And uh, I don't want to open up a completely different question like uh, people that are uh, supporting vaccinations or people that are against vaccination because it's uh, it's going to be a long debate. We probably need another few hours to talk about it. But I think what we have to do as an industry and, and people who believe on, on vaccination and they support the vaccination, I think we should talk to the people that are against it and convince them to to go and get vaccinated because this is, this, this is something that protects their lives, first of all, outside of business, outside of everything else. It's supporting their life they should understand that this is something which it, it, it's the only thing we have right now that can fight COVID and uh, bring our life back to, uh, I can't say 100% normality, but I would say to 80 or 90% normality, like we used to live before. So I think we should have a joint effort and uh, we have an obligation, the rest of us, to convince the people to get vaccinated. So, I mean, I don't want to say if it's ethical or unethical to discriminate people. Probably it's unethical to discriminate people. I don't like it either. So we, have a, we, we need to have a different role and go out there and convince the rest of the people who are against vaccination with good uh, arguments and with good objectives. Thank you, Theo. Um, we, 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 we're sort of running over time at the moment. I'm conscious of, of all the panelists and you, you, you're, you've given up your valuable time. Just 30 seconds each then in, as we come to a close here uh, from all of you. 
if we're sitting here in, in a year's time having the same debate in the webinar, what do you think, or what would you hope we would be, we'd be saying? And, and uh, as far as this whole situation is concerned, I'm going to, I'm going to start with Costas. 30 seconds, 40 seconds, Costantinos, what do, what do you think we're going to be talking about uh, in, in a year's time as far as this situation is concerned? Uh, I think uh, we're going to be talking about the same things, uh, unfortunately, because COVID is going to be here. It's not going away. Uh, let's hope for a cure, aside from, uh, from the vaccination program. Let's hope uh, people understand that uh, we need to cope with this pandemic. Uh, it's true, it's out there. Uh, we need to take our lives back. And that is why uh, the regulators really need to see beyond uh, local interests. I don't know how to put it. They need to address uh, the issue of uh, the global population to be able to travel as freely as possible as it was uh, in the past. Uh, there are ways to do it as long as we truly go over this. Uh, as a team, as, as a global team, uh, slowly, slowly, we can build it up. Uh, COVID is here, it's going to be here, and it's our responsibility to do everything we can to fight this. Okay, thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Matt, can you give me your thoughts, years time, when we, when we chat to you on the so phone? I, again? <laughs> I, I'd like to think we've kind of cracked the tough nut and we've got on with vaccination and the world feels a bit more normal. And I really hope that in September of next year, we're all talking about which team's going to win the FIFA World Cup that's being hosted here in Doha at the end of the year. That's what I hope for. Well, we always hope it's going to be England, but they never seem to do it for some reason, Matt. I don't know what it is. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Hans, give me, give me give your... Let's give something positive to look forward to. <laughs> well, yeah, but we, we keep losing cricket as well. So, uh, but anyway, um, Hans, look into your crystal ball. What, what are you going to be telling me in a year's time? Um, uh, what we what we have learned from this that we uh, a better communication with the authorities that will help a lot, and not only with with the airports, but also with the airlines and the governments and the health authorities. When they communicate together, it should be helpful. Uh, we had one, one case in Belgium, and uh, this was during the pandemic that uh, they had a COVID case, and all uh, uh, immigration, health authorities, all sitting together, what we are doing now with, with the, the discussion, what we have uh, about the pandemic. And we did the same in Belgium, in the, in the port of Antwerp, with the communication with all authorities, what was involved to do this, uh, this um, vessel, what was uh, tested positive, some crew, it was helpful to have all people together to solve this problem in, in, in a few, few days. It is helpful. Thank you very much, Hans. Uh, Fauzi, your, your, your um, view for the future and then on to Theo. Well, I, I'm, uh, I'm positive and I stay positive that things uh, will, uh, will improve. Uh, I hope that we will manage to get this vaccination program much uh, more serious and uh, much uh, faster and much more effective. And I hope that we, we, we understand seafarers are also, like all of us, they deserve rights, they deserve care and, and they should be treated fairly uh, wherever they are. So that's the most important. Brilliant. No, I totally agree. Absolutely, totally agree. I think that came out of the earlier conversation as well this morning. Theo, your uh, your your words, pearls of pearls of wisdom. Your your thoughts. <laughs> yeah, I don't I don't want to predict or project anything because last time I did it with COVID, it was a completely failure. But uh, I'm also positive, like everybody else. I think uh, that things will get much better in. Uh, in the upcoming year, I mean, a year from now, probably we'll be talking on a completely different mood. Yeah. Uh, I agree with Costas that the COVID will not go away, probably will be in our lives for many years, but uh, it will be as a regular thing that uh, we will be able to, to live with it and we will be able to deal with the problems that it brings. I think we will still have challenges in, in our industry, but uh, 
as we as we saw on, on every aspect on, on shipping, like from technical issues, from uh, inspections or crew changes, uh, we we try to overcome all these problems and we came up with new ideas. I think the next year we'll uh, bring new ideas again. I mean, the guy mentioned on the question about artificial intelligence or like this is our platform or crew changes. Many things will go into that direction. Either we like it, it's inevitable in the next few years. So probably the things that we're going to discuss in the, in the next few years is like a, a digital uh, electronic ways of doing things in, in our industry and how we change things. Brilliant. Well, thank you very much, Theo. Um, I really think we, we sort of draw a line to it now. It's been a great debate this afternoon. Uh, thank you to all the panelists and to for your time and your wisdom. It's uh, it's great to hear your your comments and your views of this. You're at the sharp end of all of this. You're dealing with these issues, and I think um, you know, the industry should should do well to to sit there and listen to to, to what you have to say. Um, thank you, Konstantinos and uh, Marine Tours for your support. Uh, greatly appreciated, um, and also to the to the teams there with um, at, at Marine Tours and also elaborate with Vasiliki and Alexandra and Karen helping to put it all together as well. It's, been, it's got a lot of effort going into all of this. So, so thank you to, to them as well. Um, and also to the participants and the delegates, uh, you've, you've taken out your time to listen to the debate today. Uh, I think it's been tremendously worthwhile. Um, a lot of really good emotive stuff here. Um, as I said, the um, the webinar will be um, filmed, has been filmed, and it will be put onto the SMI website, the, the London Shipping Week website, as well as a portal, and will be covered in the next issue of Ship Management International. But first, just to say thank you very much indeed for your time today. Um, great chatting to you. Matt, thank you so much for, for, for also coming in um, on the phone there. It's brilliant. Um, and uh, I look forward to speaking to you all again. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sean. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody.